video has surfaced of a road rage incident in Canada. Let's watch. There's a road rage incident just right there. Get back in the car. Grow up. Sit down or you're going to get arrested. Both of you, grow up. Come on, boys. Move it. What would oh, happen lovely. in South Africa? Uh, he would have shot both of them. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have been there. Yeah. <laughs> they I would have shot each other. Yeah, what, yeah, what police? <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the ultimate betrayal between a couple and the case of Annette Bowers. So if you haven't seen that, I will link it up here for you. But today we are going to talk about something that I assume most drivers have experienced. And especially if you live in South Africa, I'm sure that you've experienced this. And this is road rage. And I definitely cannot protest my innocence in this case. I definitely experienced road rage. And even this morning before going to work. It's a common occurrence and I guess it just depends on what type of driver you are. And I'm definitely heading on the more aggressive spectrum. But why we are talking about road rage is because we are actually talking about the case of the hockey stick killer. But with that being said, buckle up because there is a lot more to the story than it appears. So let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. So this story takes place in Cape Town, South Africa, but we are going deep into the heart of Cape Town and right to the bottom into the deep south in the southern suburbs of Cape Town near an area called Fishhook. And when driving to Fishhook, say from Cape Town or from another area in the north and you want to drive now to the south and you would probably take one of either two roads and that's Okap Savach or you would take Boys Drive. And both roads are stunning. They both have beautiful views. They're long, winding, mountainous roads. But what they both have in common as well is that they are long, winding, narrow, mountainous roads. And they can be incredibly dangerous if you are not paying attention. Because it's just you, your vehicle, and a cliff. And the next stop is in the ocean with a lot of rocks. So best be paying attention on these roads. But the person that we are talking about for today's case is a man named Graham Eady. He was a 35 year old man who lived in Fishhook and he was a credit manager at a local bank at the time. And Graham, his wife Wendy, and his two sons, quite young at the time, they may have been between three and five years old, but the two boys were sleeping in the back of the car and they were driving over Okarp Savach in very, very early hours of Saturday the 12th of June, 1999. Graham and his family were on their way over Okarp Savach heading towards Fishhook where they stayed. And the reason that they were busy driving in the early hours of the morning on the 12th of June, 1999, was because they had just come back from a function based on their Fishhook hockey team, which was now being hosted in Woodstock in Cape Town. And this had all taken place on June the 11th, so the Friday night before, and the party had just gone over to Saturday the 12th. So Graham, being a hockey player, had his hockey stuff in the back, because like I said, they had just come back from a function. So this family is now driving over this long, windy, dark, mountainous road. And according to Graham Eady, he said that all of a sudden, someone came really close up to the back bumper, right behind him, and started flashing his light indicating to Graham that he now needs to move so that this guy can overtake. But it's the early hours of the morning, there's no one else on this mountainous road, and where would you like Graham to go? Because we drive on the left-hand side of any road in South Africa, and generally the left is right near the cliff, so I'm not sure where he wanted Graham to go, 
but nonetheless he was flashing for Graham to move. Graham also said that this man was driving very erratically and dangerously apparently and the man we are talking about, his name was Kevin Duncan. And Kevin Duncan was 54 at the time that he was busy driving behind Graham on Okapsvach. So apparently Graham's in the front, Kevin's behind, and Kevin now started to try and overtake Graham. He then managed to overtake him. And then once he got in front of Graham, he then slowed down. And it was a constant cat and mouse with Graham and Kevin driving on each other's bumpers, backing off, flashing lights, hooting, screaming. It was a lot. So Graham, like I said, had his family in the car and he started seeing red. He was absolutely furious at this man in front of him. So now these guys are just constantly tailgating each other the whole way down this mountain. And once they get to the bottom of Okapsavach, they come to a stop. Kevin and Graham and his family are now at a dead stop at this robot at the bottom of Okapsavach. So Graham sees Kevin in front of him, alone in the car. He gets out, he walks to the boot of his car takes out his hockey stick, walks towards Kevin, so he gets out, he walks towards the driver's side on the right hand side, and he then starts smashing his hockey stick into Kevin's face. Graham would then continue to beat and beat Kevin until he had bludgeoned him to death. At one point though, Graham was hitting the top of the car, because if you think about it, a hockey stick is quite long, and to be able to swing this hockey stick at someone's head, he needed a lot of power, but he needed a small amount of precision to get this hockey stick into this window. So what he did was he didn't swing it as much at first, he was just taking it and hitting the top curvy part into Kevin's face. Then, in some reports, it did say that Graham then pulled Kevin out onto the floor, where he then started swinging the hockey stick onto Kevin's head. Witnesses at the scene, and remember this is incredibly early hours of the morning and it's a Saturday morning, so you wouldn't expect a lot of people to be around, but it doesn't mean that no one else in the world exists because you have just murdered someone. So like most murders, there is always one witness. And a witness at the scene said, quote, I saw in my rear view mirror a man at the driver's side of a Toyota Corolla with a hockey stick in his hand. The man held the stick with both hands and hit the driver in the car with it. He also hit against the top of the car door. I drove further in shock and disbelief, but turned around about two minutes later. I then saw the accused pull a hockey stick from under the deceased's bloody head. I stopped saw blood streaming from the head of the injured person. This witness was incredibly key to the whole case, but once he had come back and said that he had seen Graham pull the hockey stick from behind Kevin's head, he then drove to False Bay Hospital where he reported the incident and also asked for an ambulance and police to come to the scene. And this witness then said that when he came back the second time from the hospital, he said that he noticed that Graham was now outside walking completely casually and introducing himself to all of the other witnesses that were now staring at Kevin's lifeless body. The original witness, remember the one that just went to the hospital, he said also, quote, There was blood spatter on his jeans, he behaved like a bystander and summoned help on his cell phone. So basically, Graham had just completed this murder, and then once he was done, he stopped. He then walked around, and once people started gathering, he then pretended to be a bystander as well. And he also called for help on his cell phone, apparently. We're not exactly sure who he was really talking to, or if he was actually talking to anyone on his cell phone. Now, before we continue, I just want to pause it there, because you might be asking, okay, what happened to the kids and the wife? In some reports that I read, apparently Wendy said, to Graham when they stopped at the robot that if you get out of this car I'm going to drive away and I'm not going to come back so when Wendy saw Graham get out of the car with the hockey stick she then reportedly got into the driver's side of the vehicle and she sped away from the scene and she went home and I'm not sure if she knew to the extent what Graham had done if she stayed that long or if she left as soon as Graham got out of the vehicle. But basically, they weren't there when the, the police came, so it was just a random man who was on the floor, according to all of the witnesses. So once the police had now come onto the scene, the police noticed the bloody body on the floor, and then they noticed the bloody pair of jeans on this random man who is pretending to be a bystander. They then went to question Graham, and they were like, okay, you have a lot of blood on you. Why do you have so much blood on you? Graham apparently came up with some lies that he tried to help and he was trying to see if this person was still alive. So the police were suspicious, but they got Graham's details down on their notepad 
and Graham apparently left the scene. He then went home, changed out of his bloody clothes, and then came back to the scene. And if you know South Africa, the police don't exactly arrive in record time. It takes a while. And this is incredibly terrifying when people have home, live home invasions. It is terrifying because police can take a long time. So by the time that the police actually arrived to see Kevin's body and the murder, there were a lot of bystanders and witnesses. And there was another witness who noticed Graham, like walking around weirdly. And he also noticed the really bloody pair of jeans. And this witness was from a tow truck company and he was obviously waiting there to remove the vehicle. But what he said when he first saw Graham was that he noticed this bloody pair of jeans on this man. And he said he noticed how much blood was gushing from a head wound. And if you ever watch crime or if you ever listen to crime stories, and it is reported that the head has a lot of blood vessels. And if you do cut your head, it bleeds quite a lot. So there must have been quite a lot of blood at the scene, even though most of the attacks were only in one area of the body. Truck driver notices Graham with the bloody jeans. Then he also notices that Graham leaves the scene and returns with no bloody jeans on anymore. And he did tell police this and he wanted them to make sure that, that they kind of focused their attention on this person. Now, like I said earlier, Kevin Duncan, who is the victim in this case, was a 54 year old man at the time that he was murdered. He worked as a salesman at a very big international company. And apparently both him and Kevin were at the same fishhook hockey function at Woodstock. And they were apparently part of the same hockey club in Fishhook. So it's not to say that they knew each other, it's probably just a small world and a coincidence. So while Graham was actually at the scene, he kind of had no choice to turn himself in once police were asking each witness about what they had seen. And remember I said that the first witness was incredibly crucial because he waited for police and he said to police, that's the guy, I saw him, that is him. So police turned around, they see Graham, and Graham could not really say any lies that could convince police that he wasn't involved in some aspects. But Graham was taken into custody and he pleaded not guilty to anything. The court proceedings actually took place quite quickly after Graham was arrested. And people were obviously in shock, they were absolutely devastated at what had happened. But like I said earlier, road rage is incredibly common in South Africa. And I'm sure over many places in the world. And I'm not saying in any sense that it is as bad as this extent. But there can be some violent altercations. And sometimes people do get out of their car, throw a punch in your window or throw something at you and then get back in their car and drive away. But for instance about how violent our road rage can be, I will show you now. Yeah, let's all go. Calm down and drive. I do, you in public. Remove that. You are in public. He's filming me for no reason. You are in public, move. He's a taxi driving. This is called This is called road rage, lady. Well, what happened here? I don't get Mr. Thank you. Sorry for that. Sorry. Who are these people? So as you can see, it is common. It happens to a lot of people. And I think a lot of people can probably relate to road rage in some aspects. So there were actually a lot of supporters for Graham while he was on trial. And a lot of women wrote to Graham to say their sympathies and to give their sympathies for how he was being treated and how they understand how this could have escalated and also how road rage can make someone really angry. But during the trial, it did come out that Graham had tried previously to take his own life on at least a few occasions and at least one occasion he tried unsuccessfully to take his life. Because of this reason, he was denied bail and denied ever getting bail because of the fear of the trial and because he may be convicted that this may spring up these feelings again and that he may try and take his own life again. So now we are at the point where Graham is in court. He's sitting on trial and he has to now defend himself for what he has done. Graham's defense to murdering Kevin was that he didn't murder him and the reason that he didn't actually murder him was that he was absolutely beside himself and the reason that he was absolutely beside himself was because of Kevin's driving and how erratic he was and Kevin made him lose control. Graham said that he suffered from a temporary non-pathological criminal incapacity due to financial, marital and work stress. 
He also said that he wasn't guilty because he was actually drunk at the time that he had murdered Kevin and that he had been provoked because of what he perceived to be Kevin's bad driving. So the judge that was presiding over this case, Justice Benny Grissels, he said yes, there was definitely stress in Graham's life, but he also said, quote, there are thousands of people with the same or worse problems who don't go around clubbing fellow motorists to death. And the doctor or pathologist who looked at Kevin Duncan's body, her name was Dr. Yolanda van der Heide, and she concluded that Kevin Duncan had passed away from incredibly severe head trauma, including a fractured skull, broken upper jaw, fractured cheekbones, and a broken nose. One of Kevin's fingers were also broken as well. And during the court proceedings, the truth about what happened on the 12th of June, 1999 came out in court. Judge Gressel said that he had real problems with what Graham was telling the court and he said that he often would try and lie his way out of a lot of situations and he said that he found it really difficult to believe Graham's story of how he lost control and he said that he found it very difficult to believe or support Graham's idea that he had lost control based on Kevin's driving that night as well as that Graham thought that he couldn't be held responsible for what happened. Judge Grissel said that because of everything that Kevin said, the extensive wounds to Kevin's face particularly, he said that Graham's actions were goal-directed because Judge Grissel said, quote, he took the hockey stick from the back seat, he checked to see Mr. Duncan was alone in his car, and he decided to smash Mr. Duncan's headlights and later decided to smash the windscreen. Graham then lunged at the car door, he was able to give a blow-by-blow -blow version of the attack, and he gave false account of what happened to bystanders, who later arrived on the scene. He took the broken hockey stick from under Duncan's dead body and disposed of it. He hid his blood-splattered jeans in his own guest room, and he lied to the police. Graham tried to lie his way out of the net that was closing in around him. Judge Grissels also said that he does not believe Graham's innocence plea. The judge really believed the eyewitness testimony of Gareth Hill, who was the very first witness on scene. Remember the man who went to False Bay Hospital and the man who first drove past and saw Graham in his rearview mirror. Judge Grissel said that it was clear to him that Graham resorted to lies and deceit in order to evade trouble and that neither he nor the psychiatrist who evaluated him could rely on what he told them about the incident. He found that Graham foresaw the possibility that Kevin could die of the injuries he had inflicted on him and accepted the risk. Judge Grissels also said that Graham came to this conclusion that he could kill Kevin and when he looked at the savage and sustained nature of the attack, the fact that almost the entire attack was aimed at Kevin's head and Graham's deliberate conduct after the murder when he tried to conceal all the evidence. In the end, Graham was sentenced to 15 years in jail, but with five years suspended. So basically, Graham would only spend 10 years in prison, and he also got an extra nine months for defeating the ends of justice by hiding the hockey stick and by taking off his jeans. But we do not end there. That is not the end of the story. So we have spoken about Graham, but what about Kevin? Who is Kevin? Kevin Duncan had three children who all lived overseas at the time. He also had a wife named Karen who was living in London with their children. And sadly, six weeks after Kevin had been murdered, one of his daughters was supposed to get married and he was supposed to walk his daughter down the aisle. Karen, Kevin's wife, said that this really affected their marriage after the six weeks and after they got married because this was something that really deeply scarred their daughter. And a couple years later, their second daughter also got married and she was devastated at the fact during her wedding that her father wouldn't be able to walk her down the aisle. Karen also said, quote, Our happy married life of nearly 31 years came to an abrupt end. We had come to the stage of our lives where we were looking forward to our time together with almost all of our children settled. However, on the other side of all of this, when Wendy calls into Graham's cell and they talk, she said that for the first year that Graham was in prison, he would cry almost every single day that Wendy called him. 
and she said that Graham completely regrets everything that he had done. Wendy also said that she called Graham in prison one time and Graham was absolutely beside himself on that day. He was really really upset and crying because he had taken someone else's father away so that they couldn't celebrate Father's Day anymore. Wendy Edie also said that the killing traumatized her family and said quote that it turned their lives upside down. Wendy also said quote Graham has been part of her life for 17 years and I can't picture life without him. The bottom line is we've always loved each other despite the financial difficulties. So I thought that this was the end of the case until I found another article of Graham Edie. Apparently, Graham Edie was released in 2006, so he was arrested, tried and convicted and sent to prison in November of 2000. So remember the whole incident took place on the 12th of June 1999, trial then went and then at the end of 2000 he was then sent to prison. So apparently Graham was released in 2006 after serving half of his 10 year sentence, but after he was released and in 2014, Graham Edie was convicted and sentenced again for a second road rage incident involving a 67 year old man named Ray Scott. The incident happened in the parking lot of a quick spa on the corner of Churchill Road. Apparently, Graham said that the 67 year old man, Ray Scott, had parked in a handicapped spot but had parked at such an angle that no one else could park next to him. So Graham walked over and keyed Ray's car. There were also some reports that once Ray had seen what Graham had done to his car and other people showed what Graham did, that there was some altercation and Graham also punched Ray in the face, but not all articles say that. And Graham apparently voluntarily handed himself over to the police and he was then tried at the Weinberg Magistrates Court, where apparently Graham faced charges of malicious damage to property and he was released on bail. In a plea sentence agreement, he had to pay three fines, perform 130 hours of community service, attend an anger management course, and compensate 67-year-old Ray Scott of whom he had attacked. So that is the case of Graham Edie and what a lot that case was. I'm not sure if Graham Edie will offend again, but it just takes one thing to trigger someone and there is a possibility, I guess. But let me know what you think down below. And that is the case of the hockey stick killer. I hope you're all staying safe. Thank you for all your love and kind messages. Like I'd say, I really, really appreciate them. I hope you all have a great day further. Don't talk to strangers and I'll see you again next week. Bye.